power. Mr. Schrittman became executive editor of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette in 2003, coming to Pittsburgh from the Boston Globe, where he worked as an assistant managing editor, columnist, and Washington bureau chief. His weekly column, My Point, is syndicated nationally, and he writes a bi-weekly column for the Globe and Mail in Canada. Mr. Schrittman previously served as national political correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, covered national politics for the New York Times, and was a member of the national staff at Washington Star. He began his career at the Buffalo Evening News. In 1995, Mr. Schrittman won the Pulitzer Prize for his coverage of Washington and the American political scene, and he is author of, of a book that I think is phenomenal. I, well, I have not read it, but I love the concept. Uh, he's the author of I Remember My Teacher, a tribute to great educators. Uh, and he's regular, he was a regular panelist on the PBS show Washington Week, and he has appeared on Face the Nation and Meet the Press. A native of Salem, Massachusetts, Mr. Schrimman graduated summa cum laude from Dartmouth College with a degree in history and was a member of the Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society. He did graduate work at Cambridge University as a Reynolds Scholar, and he is a Meredith member of the Dartmouth Board of Trustees, so he knows a lot about universities as a, as a board member. Mr. Schrimman is a member of the, of the Selection Committee for the Profiles and Courage Award given by the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation and is chairman of the, of the Selection Committee of the Elijah Parrish Lovejoy Award given by Colby College. He is a member of the board of, of, of the Cole, uh, Calvin Coolidge Foundation. Mr. Schrittman and his wife, Cindy, uh, have two grown daughters, Elizabeth and Natalie. And I also know that Mr. Schrittman is a big college hockey fan, so I'm sure he knows that Robert Marsh University's men's hockey team is one of only two Division I hockey programs right now in the country that are still undefeated. We're 7-0-1 and currently ranked number 17th in the country. So we'll have to make sure we get him out to one of our games at the Island Sports Center this year. And so please join me in welcoming to Robert Marsh University, David Schrittman. David. Thank you, President Lomo. And just to warn all of you, uh, uh, 2016, it's Robert Morris versus Dartmouth, and you don't have a chance. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm delighted to be here. I always like coming here. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and I liked in particular hearing uh, the last lecture about signing statements. Uh, yes, Professor has left, but she did a marvelous job. I salute her. Our topic, uh, well, let me just say what I'm going to do here. I'm going to talk for about uh, 15, 20 minutes, and then I'm going to take your questions, and we'll engage and talk about what you guys want to talk about. Uh, but our topic this lunch hour, as you know, is power in the presidency, and it's a particularly fertile area at a time when we have a president whose power has been substantially reduced with last week's election of the Republican Senate, and who's constantly being accused by his partisan rivals and others in the legislative branch for having exceeded his constitutional powers. So this is a very interesting period in our national life, one I might add at a time when four of the last five presidents have served two terms. It wasn't so long ago, within the memory of most of us at this table here, when, um, when the respected commentators in American life were saying that the presidency was too big, too daunting, too antiquarian in its design, that it couldn't be performed well, and that American presidents like Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter and George H.W. Bush could not be reelected, and of course, none of the three was. We're in a completely different place now with three consecutive presidents having been reelected and with all three of them facing grave challenges in their final term. Impeachment in the case of Bill Clinton, economic crisis in the case of George W. Bush, and a collapse of public support in the case of Barack Obama, who already has fought three wars, maybe more, depending on how many you count, and, and who still faces economic distress and now a Congress determined to thwart him at every turn. So any discussion of power in the presidency right now necessarily has to be uh, placed in historical and temporal context. When, which powers, and how? Because we've come a long way from the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt, who most of us would agree set the template and expectations of what a president should be. It was FDR, of course, who under most definitions held enormous power, if only by virtue of being elected four times to the White House. He led the country through the Great Depression with his New Deal, and then through the world's greatest war, only to die a month before peace in Europe and four months before peace in the Pacific. But FDR is a very good place to start because it was he who set another definition of power in the presidency. The presidency, Franklin Roosevelt said, is preeminently a place of moral leadership. All our great presidents were leaders of thought 
at times when certain areas in the life of our nation had to be clarified. We should broaden that insight a little bit here and wonder aloud about power in the presidency when, unlike FDR's own time, great historic ideas in the nation were not at stake. This was of particular concern to President Clinton, who loved the presidency more than almost anyone, and who yearned to have his presidency regarded as great. But he recognized that he didn't govern during the Civil War or during World War II or even during the Civil Rights Movement, and thus he was denied a chance at greatness merely by virtue of his timing. Let's put aside President Clinton's frustrations for now, especially since it's possible we might, not, we might have another President Clinton who herself might have another chance, chance at greatness. So let's look at power. We know that wartime presidents have special power. This was true of Lincoln, who had the power of an army in the field, of course, but also wielded power in ways that you might not have expected, and in ways that unsettled people of my trade, he having prevented the unfettered liberty of the press to conduct its business during the Civil War. He padlocked, for example, the Chicago Times newspaper, which was a stain on his record and on the Union cause. He approved press restrictions. He banned anti-war newspapers. He confiscated newspaper type. He shut down their offices. That's the kind of power that Richard Nixon surely would have loved to have had during Watergate or even during the invasion of Cambodia. But let's please not single out Richard Nixon here. President Clinton would like to have that power, and President Bush would have, and President Obama wouldn't mind it either. The question of presidential power in our own time comes down to what Richard Neustadt, the Columbian and Harvard student of the presidency and a dear friend of mine during his lifetime, described as merely the power to persuade. President Obama used that power in his first year to push through Obamacare and to push through his economic stimulus. And he calculated that the use of his political capital at that time was worth it, and maybe it was. The Republicans on Capitol Hill are gonna try to repeal Obamacare next year. The Republican House repealed it more than 40 times last year, and you can see what effect that had. And when then they do it again next year, the president will simply use another one of his powers, the power of the veto, to end it. It'll be a game of whack-a-mole, but it'll have a very predictable and a very certain resolution. Obamacare will not be repealed. This president, all presidents, search for ways to extend their power as they find that the restraints of the Constitution are frustrating and the dance of legislation on Capitol Hill is irritating and distracting. President Nixon, as we have said, invaded Cambodia without asking anybody's opinion or permission. President Bush transformed the anti-terrorism legislation after September 11, 2001 into an accordion. He allowed the Justice Department, the FBI, and the CIA to go into areas early for, earlier forbidden to them and perhaps even forbidden under his legislation. Mr. Obama spoke openly a few days ago of using his powers to make moves on immigration that he could never win from Congress and that will surely inflame the Congress as well. Expect some hotheads on the right to speak of impeachment and expect some Democrats to say quietly, of course, that maybe the president has gone too far. Presidents have authority under the Constitution, but they win authority from voters. President Reagan in his early days had the same constitutional powers that Jimmy Carter had in his late days. But nobody can argue that the power that Mr. Reagan had on January 21, 1981 was anything but, great, but greater than the power that Mr. Carter had in the earlier hours of that day. It's simply not comparable. And in fact, one can argue, and I've argued this many times, that Ronald Reagan possessed the power of the presidency for a year before he was even elected. Look at President Carter's last budget and tell me if you don't think that Ronald Reagan, who then held no office, might have been his ghostwriter. President Obama had loads of power in 2009. He won a Nobel Prize before he did much of anything. He flew into power in a gust of public support unlike anything I've ever seen. And let me remind you, a gust of public support that's far greater and stronger than the one John F. Kennedy had on the day he gave perhaps the greatest inaugural address of our time. President Obama was more than a president, he was a phenomenon. And then it disappeared, it disappeared just like that. The um, presidency in a way disappeared and the phenomenon almost certainly did, and so did the power. He won Obamacare and some economic legislation, but since then he's been struggling for, a pow for power in a system that since the Kennedy years had given so much more power to the executive than to the legislative branch. 
Think about that landmark book that Arthur Schlesinger Jr. wrote called The Imperial Presidency. It was a reaction against the increase in power that the presidency had won. It was written in 1973, the year before Nixon resigned, four years after Lyndon Johnson left office. It is a work of history, but it's also a period piece. In my own days covering Capitol Hill, which extended for about two decades, there was no question where the power was. These were the Reagan years, and the power was downtown, 16 blocks from the Capitol. The main show was in the White House. Congress went along, but that is about all it did. It went along. So let's agree that whatever any one of us thinks about the current period, Congress is not going along. It's going its own way, and that's even before the new senators are seated in the Republican chamber and before the new House members give the Republicans the greatest majority in the chamber since the Truman years. Barack Obama is still president, but aside from foreign affairs, he doesn't have much power. So let's speak a little bit about foreign affairs before we close and take questions. The president, as commander-in-chief, has prerogatives no Congress can conceivably possess. We know what they are. He can order trips into battle. He can order bombers into the air. He can scatter the leaders of al-Qaeda or ISIS. He can do all that, but he can only do it for a time. In fact, the president, recognizing where power lies, is actually asking Congress for its support in the war against ISIS. And that's probably a smart move. Every president since Nixon has resented the War Powers Act, which was, I think, passed in 1973, and which restricts presidential prerogatives and war making. But it remains on the books despite the presidential objections. So now let's have a brief assessment of where we are. We have a president who has the advantage of two terms, but the disadvantage of a Congress virulently in opposition to him and to his proposals and to his priorities. We have a Congress that has the power to thwart the president. We have two years before the next election. We can't argue that the public doesn't want this. The public created this. So think of the next two years as a political laboratory or petri dish. We're going to see all sorts of efforts to create power and to use power. It's going to be fascinating. And in case you didn't realize that I'm a newspaper man and not a historian, let me add this. You're going to need a, new news a good newspaper in the next two years. <laughs> On that last matter, amid a discussion of power in the presidency, I hope I can make a powerful point. And I have an 800 number if any of you want to subscribe. <laughs> Before we give out subscription uh, labels, I'm happy to take questions. We have about, oh, 30 minutes. So I'm happy to take questions from anybody on this topic or any other. Yes, sir. Dean. Well, let me rephrase the question. Um, uh, dean, uh, su the dean suggests that uh, most people are moderates, that our parties aren't moderate, that there are fewer moderates. Uh, the parties have gone to the extremes, and that uh, they don't reflect the public where it stands. Let me talk a little bit about the premise here, that most people are moderates. I think that that was true, um, and still is slightly true. But um, I think. Uh, Latest studies suggest that people are less moderate than they were uh, in your childhood and in mine. Uh, the percentage of, of uh, Democrats who were, um, who were committed liberals has tripled in the past 20 years. And the percentage of Republicans who are committed conservatives has doubled in the last 10. So the moderates are increasingly a donut in the whole. The parties have both created and reflected that. Now, I know you're creating a political science degree here, so you have no, you have no guilt in this. But around the 50s, the American Political Science Association uh, commissioned a study about parties around the world. And they came out with this um, kind of conclusion that American parties are 
worthless, they stand for nothing, they're not liberal, they're not conservative, they have no party ideology, they have no party discipline, they're just basically, you know, they just sit there, they have nothing, they, they stand for nothing. This, um, this came about 15 years after President Roosevelt himself tried to create a liberal party out of the Democratic Party in the 1938 midterm elections which was six years into his term, just as President Obama is six years into his. And he tried to purge from the Democratic Party the old mastodons who were conservatives so as to create a, excuse me, so as to create a progressive party. It backfired terribly. He was very lucky it backfired because the very uh, men who opposed the New Deal and the Democratic Party were the only ones who supported him in his party as he moved from neutrality toward engagement in World War II between 39 and 41. Um, so you have a situation where President Roosevelt and the American Political Science Association um, desperately wanted to change the nature of our parties. And our parties used to have right wings and left wings. The, the uh, Republican Party had liberals and moderates. The Democratic Party had con moderates and conservatives. And we know who they are in recent history, in the last 35 years. Today, the parties have been purged of the people on the opposite extremes. The, I think it's a tautology now to say that the Republicans are a conservative party, the Democrats are a liberal party. And where even a decade ago there was a crossover, today the most conservative Democrat is more in the, on the Hill is more liberal, according to his voting record or her voting record, is, than the most, is more liberal than the most liberal Republican. There's no Republican who is, more who is more liberal than any member of the Democratic Party. That is a huge change in our politics. As a result, we don't have the kind of uh, bipartisanship we had before. The bipartisanship that created, for example, um, the great social legislation of our time, the Social Security Act of 1935, the, um, the Medicare Bill of 1965, the there are more Republicans supported the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 than did Democrats. More Republicans supported that liberal legislation than Democrats. Today, that's inconceivable. So our parties have changed. They both reflected. It's like a mutual. Um, it's like in nature, one of those mutual uh, reinforcement systems, like you have with global warming. Um, the uh, parties have reflected and created these divisions in our life, American civic life. It's a fascinating development. We are in an entirely different political world in 2014 than we were even in 1994, three, uh, which I guess was 20 years ago. Yes, sir. Well, there's a song, you know, that can answer that question. Uh, um, but I'll, I'll leave that to, uh, who, who, uh, whose song was that? Um, but uh, what is war, you know? Uh, yeah, I was afraid you might say that. Um, uh, war used to be a well-defined legal, um, legal matter. Uh, it was well-defined in the Mexican War, not so much the Civil War, uh, Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, where Congress, where Congress declared war. Congress did not declare war in Korea. It didn't declare war in Vietnam. It didn't declare war in the Dominican Republic in 1965, in Panama in 1990. It didn't declare war in Grenada in 1983. It did, I can go on and on. It didn't declare war in lots of places. Congress did give its approval for, um, for military action in both the, f the Ira Iraq wars and in Afghanistan. And it will be asked to do so in, uh, in ISIS, even though we're already engaged. But we no longer have the um, congressional declaration of war with one woman from Montana always voting against it, um, which will happen with both World War I and World War II. Um, we don't have that anymore, uh, in part because of the change of our status, I think, uh, uh, as a superpower, uh, the, stat the change of the nature of conflict, which has moved from the nation state, which was the preeminent 
um, power structure in the 19th and uh, 20th century through around 1980. Um, uh, we now, uh, our wars uh, are against insurgencies sometimes, as they were in Panama and in Lebanon and in Grenada uh, and elsewhere. Uh, they're against religiously affiliated outfits. Um, uh, England used to fight those kind of wars uh, against the Mahdi in, uh, um, Churchill was in that war in, in Sudan. Uh, and it's only recently that we're in those kind of wars. So the nature of, of conflict and the nature and the diminishment of the role of the nation state in conflict has changed the definition of war. I hope that's helpful. Yes, sir. You know, it's the second time someone has had made the, the absolute correct plural of a word ending in M, and I salute <laughs> Robert Morris University for your erudition on that. <laughs> but go ahead. Um, if, you know, if you watch Press Symposia, Excellent. Um, you'll see you know, journalists are asked to comment on press freedom under the Obama administration. And increasingly, you see uh, journalists coming out and saying, no, in fact, press freedoms are not very good, and that they're, they're getting worse. Um, can you comment on that, and particularly the claim just now? This is the claim about, um, put briefly, uh, reporters complaining about the administration not being good to them. Uh, you know, there's been a continuum of that since the, um, since really the Johnson years, where we, we all thought, again, I wasn't part of we then, uh, that the Nixon people were horrible and the Ford got a pass, and, the, and if there's anything worse than Nixon, it was Clinton, and if, I mean Carter, if there's anything worse than Carter, well, it was Reagan, and it, it's gone from there. Uh, I'm, I haven't been in Washington during the Obama administration, but I, but I was in Washington for Ford through W. And it has seemed to gotten progressively uh, worse, in part uh, because uh, pre uh, the reporters, I think, and the press have felt um, more muscular, I think, in their uh, uh, reporting. Um, they're less stooges of or less easily um, cowed than they were during the, um, say, the Roosevelt years when the reporters would hang around the president's um, I mean, President DeLoma wouldn't even like this. Uh, reporters hanging around the president's desk, um, let alone, always welcome. Okay, um, it's on the record, guys. Always welcome. Um, so uh, reporters used to be able to wander around the White House. We can't do that anymore. Uh, president Reagan, um, you know, gave a lot of press conferences, and I think the number have gone down since then. They're less worthwhile than they ever have been. The greatest amount of, I think, of um, press adulation came during the Kennedy years when President Kennedy was extremely adept at using uh, the press conference and of using foils among uh, us to make his points. Um, I think in this era where the, um, where the administration has cracked down on, on press prerogatives, uh, has caused a uh, rebellion among all of us and a great deep sense of resentment about the restrictions we're under and uh, the difficulty of, of covering the White House and of um, and situations where the um, administration has actually threatened to prosecute uh, reporters for merely doing their jobs. Now, that's not all that unusual. We get arrested all the time. Uh, or we had a reporter arrested at the G20 uh, in Pittsburgh merely for doing her job. Um, uh, this happens from time to time. It's never pleasant. She spent a night uh, in jail. Uh, I'm not sure how the food was. Uh, but um, this has been a constant problem. President Lincoln, who's all of our heroes, was uh, an atrocious friend of the press, and he owned part of a newspaper and was the most dedicated newspaper reader ever. In fact, when he was postmaster uh, in New Salem, Illinois, he, uh, papers then were distributed by mail, and he would read the papers before putting them in people's mail slots. Uh, the president engaged in long conversations with the major editors of the time, who were um, Horace Greeley, who eventually ran for president in 1872, uh, Horace Greeley and um, uh, Henry Raymond and John uh, 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 Gordon Bennett or Bennett Gordon, I forget which one. But I mean, he engaged them, but he was very, very tough. And my own feelings 
about what we should publish and whether we should restrain ourselves were deeply affected by my reading of a new book uh, by Harold Holzer on Lincoln and the Press, which is called Lincoln and the Press, um, when the administration tried to prosecute reporters for printing battle plans that the Union was going to use in uh, the first uh, Manassas, which of course was a Union disaster. And, and then it was realized, real, uh, revealed that huge piles of these battle plans were uh, distributed to anyone who wanted them in the lobby of the hotel right beside the White House. And I um, began to say that uh, that tells me that there was a specific episode in the, with the Post-Gazette in which we went ahead and printed something that authority figures begged us not to uh, because I felt that, um, that their uh, entreaties to us um, in essence, we're asking us to suppress something that had already been revealed. So, sorry to make that a long answer, but it's something of, I uh, promised I'd get to you next, but you'll be after that. Yes, sir. The question is: Is it is the does the press have an unfair, uh, unfair and unbalanced preoccupation with the president, and not enough attention on the Congress? Well, you know that can be an advantage if you're a president who knows how to use the press, as Presidents Reagan and Kennedy were, uh, and a huge disadvantage if you don't, like uh, President uh, Carter and um, and George W. were now. And then, then you have the phenomenon of ex-presidencies. I know you didn't ask that, but I do want to get involved in this because of the publication today of the new book by W. Uh, on his father. Um, President Bush the first, whom I covered and knew quite well, uh, had a really hard time from the press. We gave him unremitting grief. He didn't. He was isolated. He was an. He was an elitist. I remember myself covering um, in 1987 his presidential announcement, and he came down the um, steps of Air Force Two. I was the pool reporter that day, and he was greeted by a bunch of uh, big shots in, um, in uh, Houston uh, where he made his announcement, and he uh, said to one of them, how are you hitting them, like, you know, golf or tennis? And I said to myself, this is country club elitist. This guy's repugnant. I can't stand this guy, you know? And then I got to cover him a little bit, and I got to see a little more of him and uh, covered him for two summers in Kennebunkport and uh, had interchanges with him over the course of, was 80, 92, so over the course of 25 years. And I would say I love that man like almost no other public figure I've ever covered except with the exception of Bob Dole. Now I know this will ruin all of your, all of your, um, assumptions about the editor of the Post-Gazette who's supposed to love above all Karl Marx and, um, <laughs> and Frederick Engels when Trotsky himself is not available. Uh, but in fact, uh, and I went to see President Bush a couple uh, last summer, um, I regard him as the greatest president of my, my lifetime in some ways and certainly one of the greatest people I've ever known. And so uh, reporters are vulnerable to um, to being to liking a president. Now I, I'm proud to say that I didn't fall in love uh, with him until um, after he was out of office, and um, uh, but I got to know him in a different way uh, as I got to know President Ford after his presidency. You know, um, one of the criticisms of the press uh, class is that we fall in love with the people we cover and. Uh, you know, but generally speaking, I would say that I have liked many of, of the men, and most of the men and women I've covered. I've had respect for them. It's, uh, I wouldn't say this only on, on Veterans Day, but they were patriotic and served their country by their best lights. And um, you may call me a simp and a, um, you know, a, a, a unrepentant uh, ro uh, romantic, but I think American presidents generally in my lifetime, the ones I've covered and I've known every president from Ford to Obama, uh, have uh, generally put their country first and um, been uh, admirable people. And 
I suppose uh, that will expose me to the slings and arrows of people who think that we should hate them all. Uh, I, I, we should be there. We are their, um, their adversaries uh, in this adversarial relationship while they're in office. Um, but sometimes they admire us, and sometimes we admire them, and sometimes we deplore them, and sometimes they're worthy of being deplored. And in almost all the cases we've mentioned, their relations to the press have been um, have been uh, less than uh, uh, less than gentlemanly and less than courtly, and I think less than fair-minded. Yes, ma'am. I, I think I owed, owed somebody else a question. I'll take her and then you. Go ahead. You. Well, generally speaking, but not always, rich people tend to feel more congenial in the Republican Party, but not always. Uh, I've worked for the most conservative newspaper in the United States, the Wall Street Journal, and the most liberal, the New York Times and the Boston Globe. And in neither case did the ideology, perceived ideology, of the editorial page or the owners have any effect on even one word I typed? Now, maybe you would say that subliminally they went and hired people who were congenial to their views, but if that was so, how can you explain the same guy being hired by the Boston Globe and the Wall Street Journal? Um, in those papers, as in ours, there is a separation between the opinion function and the news function. And I explain this to almost every audience I speak to, and I speak once or twice a week. And not one person I've spoken to in the last 12 years has believed me when I've told them that I'm not a member of the editorial board of the Post-Gazette. I don't go to their meetings. I'm not consulted, nor do I give my views on uh, endorsements, nor am I told who they en endorse, nor even do I read the editorial page of my own newspaper. And I think most newsmen and women feel that way. I'm in the news business, not in the opinion business. Um, I don't give my opinion. Uh, I accept when it's uh, safe to do so, about an administration maybe two or three um, administrations out. Um, you'll notice that I haven't told you whether I think Obama is a, is a, a lout or a hero. Um, my wife doesn't even know my views on this, and I'm not alone among newsmen and women who feel this way. When I came to the Post-Gazette, my predecessor was editor of the newspaper and a member of the board of, of uh, the editorial board, and I asked to be to my first day to relinquish that role and to take my vow of chastity with the editorial board. And I'm pleased to do that. It's given me something to, to tell audiences really for 12 years, and as I say, not one person I've told this actually believes it, but it is true. And so most of us really have no ideology. We believe in the news. We believe in journalism. We believe in doing our job. Not long ago, I had a job candidate in the office uh, who we were about to hire. Everybody loved this guy. And I don't know what made me ask this question. Uh, I said, are you on record? Because we're in a different age now and with the web. Are you on record on the web with having strong views on any issues? He said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. I said, well, what are those? He said, well, I'm, uh, I'm very anti-war, and I believe fracking is is a threat to the environment, and I'm very active on websites that promote those causes. 
And I said, well, then you can't work here. I mean, this conversation is over. He said, well, why? I said, because we believe in journalism more than we believe in any of those causes. And, and he looked at me quizzically. He was about 26 or 27, a very smart guy, very likable. Um, and we really wanted this guy. He had skills we did not have in-house. Uh, and we have not been able to find somebody with those skills. Uh, but I couldn't take him in. And I explained to him that we relinquish our right to have opinions in exchange, in a kind of a social compact, unspoken but lived and breathed every day. We, uh, we give up our right to have an opinion and to march in abortion rights and to picket uh, for, for, for or against abortion rights, or to picket for or against fracking, or to say Obama's a creep or to say he's a great guy. We relinquish that fundamental American right in exchange for special rights we have under, the, under our laws, the First Amendment and laws growing out of that. We have special protections and special privileges that in my mind outweigh my right to say that abortion is murder or abortion is a woman's choice. Um, I covered abortion for the Wall Street Journal full time for two years without having an opinion about what abortion is right or wrong. And even now, I struggle with the issue. And I don't want to decide. I'm not a member of, of either party. That's not unusual. I'm married to a reporter. She isn't either. Uh, I don't vote in primaries. That's not unusual. Um, and so we have made ourselves in a way you think we're court jesters, but I think we're court eunuchs. We have made ourselves, we have taken, we have relinquished certain rights to be able to do our jobs with efficiency and with forthrightness and with honesty. And so, I don't remember how what started me on this, Jag, but, um, but uh, I don't know who, you know, our company is owned, run by, two, by twins. One of them is deeply conservative, one of them is very liberal, okay? Believe me, I'm not getting involved in that game, <laughs> okay? I think, and my own, um, you know, my column might be syndicated, but it could be syndicated in a lot more places if I weren't a white, formerly middle-aged moderate. Um, there's no call for a moderate in American Journal uh, on our ad pages today. So that's just the way I live and the way my colleagues at the Post-Gazette live, and I think my colleagues in the national press think of themselves, and. Uh, we do our jobs. Yeah, we, we cash their paychecks, but, um, but I don't know. Is GE a conservative or a liberal company? I don't know. I went to college with Jeff Immelt. I couldn't tell you who he vote, voted for. He's the president of GE, runs NBC. So, yes, sir, I owed you one. Oh, this is the bad news, good news bias. <laughs> oh, man, someone set me up with a softball here. I can't tell you the number of stories we have written in the past week, including one today on the Power Source page at the top across five columns on my orders about the effect of lowering energy prices on this and that. But let's get to the good news, bad news one. You can tell, I'm sorry if this sounds like it's rehearsed, but I've given this answer 70, 70 times this week alone. Um, I hope every plane that lands out here lands safely. But when they do, one by one, of course we don't have any planes here anymore, um, <laughs> but, but, but with those few we have, land, we are not going to write a story saying that the flight from Charlotte, because that's really the only place you can go. Um, don't get me started on that issue. Um, one of the reasons we are successful, uh, President Delomo, in keeping all of our young people in Pittsburgh is there are no flights out of here. <laughs> um, we are not going to write a story saying U.S. Air Flight 2711 from Charlotte landed safely today. On the day, and I dread its occurrence that one of them doesn't land safely, we will write about that. New, I define news as the departure from the ordinary. That's usually often bad. 
We have a column, us alone, among newspapers called Random Acts of Kindness. It runs, it runs on page two, in which we chronicle good things that happen. Now, talking about bias. We do have a bias. There are two of them. One of them is a bias, and then you're talking about the national press here, a bias toward change. If things don't change, we have no story. The other is more subtle, and it, it wreaks its ugly head on Capitol Hill more than on the White House. And that is a bias toward people who are quotable and accessible. If you are a senator and you never talk to us, you are never going to get quoted in our paper. If you are Bob Dole, whose views, I'm guessing, couldn't be more different from the views of most members of the national press, you're in the paper all the time and almost never in a negative way because Bob Dole um, was always available. He was always fun. He was always easy to talk to. He always has as much time as you needed for you as a reporter. And not only the Wall Street Journal guy, but the guy from you know, the paper in um, Albany, Georgia, and Albany, New York, and uh, Saratoga Springs, New York, and Sarasota, Florida. He had time for all of us. And um, that wins you a lot of friends. And it's hard to, uh, it's hard to argue that um, people with really good press relations and instincts toward, um, toward uh, openness to the press tend to do better. Um, uh, Bob Dole, it's not too much to say that Bob Dole was adored by the national press at the very time when everybody talked about how liberal the press was. Um, other, uh, Bob Bird, who was his counterpart for many years and whose views were more congenial probably to the so-called liberal press, never got half the shake that Bob Dole did because Bob Dole was fun and accessible. And that's a character flaw of ours. You know, we like people who are nice to us, and it's a, it's a character flaw, I admit, but it's Im an immutable one. Looks, oh, one more, then I guess I'm off the hook. Sure. The president has asked about the zeal to be first. Now, this is not a new thing. During um, the hours after 1 o'clock on the 22nd of November, 1963, I think I have this right, the Associated Press uh, guy picked up the phone and called New York and said, Kennedy has been shot or dead. And then he ripped the phone line out of the wall so the UPI guy couldn't call. Now, we call that two things unfair and really smart. <laughs> so I think the zeal to be first is, um, is a natural uh, part of the DNA of writers. Uh, you know, people of my faith think that the Old Testament, because it came first, is better than the new one that came second. <laughs> um, my wife, who uh, prefers the second version to the first, feels differently. Uh, they both are full of truths. Um, that was a particularly dangerous example for me to give. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, we want to be first because that's part of our DNA. But there was an example uh, when less than five, five days in which we had a story, another news outlet had a story, and I knew they had it first, and I didn't think we had enough or we didn't say it, couldn't say what we needed to say with the um, depth and perspective, and so we were, I was able to be beaten on this, and I didn't mind. Uh, there are some stories where I say to a reporter, and these usually involve salacious, illegal uh, activity of the sexual natter, ma uh, nature, in which I always say to our reporters, you know, that's a story I don't mind to be, be being beaten on. Um, 
But generally, I think reporters want to be first. Sometimes accuracy is sacrificed. It's done more often, I would argue, on the electronic press, digital press, than it is in the print press, though it is done on the print press with too much frequency. Um, I would amend, President Lomo, I would, I would amend that thing to want to be first, but we want to be first, but we mostly want to be right. And by mostly, I don't mean like in 65% of the time. I mean all the time to be right. Um, and there are times you're wrong. Um, uh, one news outlet in this uh, community reported first that Russ Grimm would be the next coach of the um, Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, the, another news outlet in this uh, community uh, didn't uh, write that story ever because he didn't become the, the uh, if you don't believe me, you can ask uh, Coach Tomlin. Um, so, so, but we're wrong too. We are, we are wrong too sometimes. You can't, I mean, we write 70 stories a day. I mean, how many times can you do 70 stories and have 70 things in life and have every one of them be right? Which is why we have corrections. Um, why I'm on the phone, I'll just tell you one story before I scoot out of here. There were five or six controversies for some reason yesterday raging and every, everybody in Pittsburgh was calling me and complaining about something in the paper. And finally, for relief, I called my friend who's the editor of the Detroit News. And I said, can I speak to John Woolman? And the, the secretary said, it's David Tribman. And he said, put it through. And I, he picked up the phone and says, I'll speak to you on one condition. And I said, what's that? He said, as long as you don't yell at me. <laughs> Everybody was yelling at him, too, yesterday. So I often say that I'm uh, Pittsburgh's um, fire hydrant. Um, so have a good time. Anyhow, I've really enjoyed this. If you have any questions, I'll just hang around here and be happy. Otherwise, go back to class. And thanks very much for inviting me.